At this time, I would call upon Mr. Nathan Hunter, Chair of the Jefferson Community College Board of Trustees, to introduce our keynote speaker. It is indeed a privilege to introduce our speaker this evening, General Walter Pyatt, Commanding General of the 10th Mountain Division in Fort Drum. General Pyatt's distinguished career in armed services spans nearly four decades and began when he enlisted in the Army after graduation from high school in Pennsylvania. Military assignments have taken him around the world to Korea, Panama, Hawaii, Alaska, and Germany. He has completed operational deployments to Saran, Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Most recently, General Pyatt and the division headquarters were deployed to Iraq for operational inherent resolve, just returning just a few short months ago. We are fortunate here in the North Country because General Pyatt's career has brought him back to Fort Drum numerous times, first in 1999 and again in 2012 as the Deputy Commanding General of Support. After ser serving at the Pentagon, first as Director of Army o Operations Readiness and Mobilization, and then as Director of Operations Army Rapid Capabilities Office, General Pyatt returned once again, this time as Commander of the 10th Mountain Division in Fort Drum in 2017. He has become a familiar face here in the North Country, speaking regularly at community events about the important mission of Fort Drum, its role here at home, and of our nation's efforts to win the peace in Iraq. General Pyatt holds a bachelor's degree in biology and two master's degrees, all from Lock Haven University in Pennsylvania. Additionally, he was awarded an honorary doctorate degree in public service from his alma mater. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, General Walter Pyatt. Well, it's good to be here tonight. Normally, I'm the one that's always overdressed, but I marched in with this distinguished crowd sitting behind me. It's pretty cool. You know, because their stripes and their robes and their medals for education are a lot more important than the ones I wear on my chest. As a soldier, I get often asked to deploy around the world to help protect our freedom. But it's those who educate that can really secure our future and win the peace by opening up minds. So good evening, everyone. I'll tell you, it's a real honor for me tonight. And Dr. Stone, I thank you for asking me here. She texted me. When I was in my office, I got a text from my buddy, the president, say, are you free on the 14th of December? And I, of course, I said, yes, ma'am. What would you like me to do? But I can't think of a better person to lead this college, to have a brilliant woman with the sole purpose of opening up minds and passing it on and enlightening others. That's a pretty cool job. And you do it well. Thank you. But as a soldier, I, I know the value of education. And I'm thrilled that so many of you have taken advantage of this opportunity. Because the places I've been, it's not provided everywhere. So I'm proud that you seize this opportunity. I know it's been difficult. As a soldier, I also know that training, and there are many soldiers out there, many veterans there tonight, and I know you know this, that training prepares us for the expected in life, while education prepares us for the unexpected. And it is always the unexpected that defines us. I faced many unexpected situations during military deployments. In 2004, when deployed to Afghanistan, our unit was preparing for the upcoming elections, the first ever free elections in the history of Afghanistan. My job was to ensure each district had a security plan to safeguard the first elections, and one district in particular was very, very dangerous. 
It was along the border with Pakistan. I was authorized money to allow the tribes in the area to pay for additional security. My good friend, the governor of Paktika province, Governor Gulab Mangal, asked me to travel there to see firsthand the security plan. Upon arrival, we were greeted with celebration from all the tribal leaders. They were proud to show their governor the security plans for their election. Their attitude made me feel relieved and confident that this dangerous place is now working in a positive direction. I felt proud as they were now embracing the security challenges I tried so hard to convince them to address. The tribal leaders asked the governor and me to come see their polling site and how they planned to secure it. As we walked to the site, many of the villagers joined in. My confidence was high to see so many people peacefully joining together to secure their tribal region and embrace democracy. As we approached the polling site, the tribal leader pointed to the building and stated, here, here is our security plan. I looked at the site, and there stood only a single security guard. I thought I was losing something in the translation. But soon it was clear that the tribes all agreed to give the money to one man, a respected older tribal member. I thought, well, this must be a respected warrior of the tribes and someone who comes with many warriors. But as we got closer, I could see that this was a very old man, and he really was the only security person for the site. I thought as a military commander that I should inspect the guard more closely. As I did, it was also very apparent that this older gentleman was completely blind. All my military training did not prepare me for this moment. My military training taught me to secure critical sites with overwhelming force, consisting of highly trained soldiers, so to secure the most dangerous place in my area of operations at the time with only one man who was blind was simply not taught in any military class or training I attended. But my education taught me that I simply don't know everything and that I should always welcome a differing perspective. The governor could see my confusion and my career washing away before my very eyes, but he whispered to me, this will work. The people have decided, he told me, and a tribal agreement in Afghanistan could not be broken. I reported, reluctantly, to my higher headquarters that the area was secure. Of course, I had left off the details that the most dangerous place in Paktika province was being guarded by an old blind man. But it worked. The elections were a huge success. 98% of the people in Paktika province voted. Where months earlier, the United Nations said Afghanistan will have elections, but they will not be held in Paktika because it's simply too dangerous. And of that 98%, 48% were females. And there were no incidents of violence in the district guarded by the blind warrior. In another village in Afghanistan, I'm also reminded how education prepares us for more unexpected events. We were in a village also near the Pakistan border, well north of the previous place where my blind security guard saved the day. This village was normally peaceful, but they were also very, very poor. They had asked us for medical assistance, and on, on this day we brought doctors and nurses to their village to include female doctors and nurses so that they could treat the females in their village. The day was a huge success. And we felt proud and happy that we made a difference in this village as well as making friends in this very troubled region. When we departed the village, 
The children lined the road waving to us with their hands extended, asking the soldiers for some small gift, perhaps a pencil or a treat. This was a very common sight for us, and soldiers would often throw a pen, a pencil, or some treats to the Afghan children. As the last vehicle departed, a small figure rushed through the crowd and threw something toward the vehicle. The gunner, up in the turret, saw the object and identified it as a grenade, which landed on top of his vehicle. He acted quickly, yelling to his crew members, grenade, as he sunk down into his vehicle. Luckily, the grenade rolled onto the back of the vehicle and lodged in the equipment we tied to the back of our Humvees. The soldiers taking cover in their vehicle were protected when the grenade exploded. But as it did, the gunner did, again did exactly what he was trained to do. He popped back up in his turret, manned his gun, saw what appeared to be the person fleeing from the scene that threw the grenade. And behind his 50 caliber machine gun, his next action was one of the most decisive military actions I have witnessed in combat. In that moment of seeing a combatant throw a grenade onto his vehicle, taking cover to absorb the blow, and then immediately manning his weapon and citing the person responsible, he elected not to shoot. The fleeing enemy appeared to be a small child, and many children standing around would have certainly been hit if he fired his powerful machine gun. By not acting, this soldier acted, not relying on his training, but rather his values. His inaction maintained the initiative through restraint. We halted the convoy, returned to the village, and as I approached the elders of the village, I could see the fear in their eyes. They assumed we would raid the village and arrest all the males. We elected not to. I told them instead that this attack disrespected our forces. We came here to help the village, and you accepted our help and then attacked us as we departed. I could sense that I shamed them. I told them that we would not leave until they brought those responsible for the attack. We stayed, sleeping in the snow for several days, but the villagers would not tell us who was responsible. And my other duties required me to return to my base. I did not want to leave, but my staff and my command kept telling me, sir, you have to get back to your base. I knew if we pressured the villagers and remained calm, we could find the person responsible, but we had to go. So I gathered the elders and I told them that I expected them to find the people responsible and bring them to my camp. I promised them that I would listen before taking any action. I gave them two weeks. And as we left, I knew that the villagers would never come to the camp with a person responsible, but I knew that way I could return with a bit more leverage to try to find the reason for this attack. But to my great surprise, two weeks later, a delegation of village elders arrived at our base camp. They stated they were here to meet the commander. We brought the delegation into our meeting room. They stated that they found the person responsible and presented a small boy who appeared to be only 10 years old. Then they asked me not to arrest the boy, but instead arrest his father, who was standing by the young boy. The father was frightened and sad. I could see that his offer was sincere and must have been agreed upon by all the elders. But seeing the father standing by his son made me think of my father, who had recently passed prior to this deployment. I could see that this man was prepared to take responsibility for his son's actions 
in order to save face for his tribe. My training prepared me for combat, but my education prepared me to feel empathy for this father and his son. My training told me to arrest both and interrogate to find the roots of the enemy inside this village. My education allowed me to explore my heart for different options. I asked the boy if he would like to meet the soldier he threw the grenade. The elders had no idea what I was doing. I knew they were afraid, but we instead showed them the vehicle and the soldier who could, he could have killed that day. The soldiers were confused as well, but we embraced the boy and showed him our human side, and that we were not the infidel, but rather people people who cared about them and wanted to protect them. This act led to another meeting where their villagers told us what really happened, how the young boy was threatened by the enemy who told him to conduct the attack, or him and his entire family would be killed. We returned to this village and helped them break from the insurgent's grip and find strength to secure them from this outside threat. And once again, we maintain the initiative through restraint. By not shooting, we hit the target squarely in the bullseye. In military training, initiative is gained and retained through action. But in real war, inaction was also a way to regain the initiative. My training prepared me to secure polling sites with numerous security guards, well-armed and well-trained. My training prepared me to kill or capture the enemy using my military strength. My education allowed me to see that there are numerous solutions to problems and that I need to keep an open mind. My education allowed this soldier to learn that compassion can be more powerful than bullets. My undergraduate degree was in biology and chemistry. I learned much about science, but I learned much more, and so have you. I don't know what challenges you will face in your life, but you will, and your training will prepare you for the expected, but it's your education here at JCC, from the books, the professors, your peers, your family, that have prepared you for the unexpected. Know that education is not a degree. It's not a grade point average. Education is the key to opening your mind and using your mind to do good for all of humankind. Thank you for taking this journey. This is not the end, but rather the beginning. And I look forward to the great things you will accomplish on your climb to glory. The world is about to benefit from your deeds. There is no challenge too great for an educated mind. Thank you very much. General Pyatt, thank you for making this 2018 fall commencement truly special. We sincerely appreciate your commitment to education, to the North Country, and to our country. It is an honor to have you with us this evening. We thank you and all those you lead for your service.